Welcome to the Tobacco Online Policy Seminar Talks. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Si Shang, a tobacco control researcher at Ohio State University. The seminar will be one hour with questions asked by the moderator and discussants. The audience may post questions and comments in the Q&A panel, and the moderator will draw from these questions and comments in conversation with the presenter. For this presentation, we will allow questions to be posted either publicly or privately. Publicly posted questions will be discuss may be discussed by the presenter, the presenter's co-author, and others. Please review the guidelines on tobaccopolicy.org for acceptable comments. Please keep the comments professional and related to the research being discussed. Public posts that are not particularly germane to the research question will be dismissed. Comments meeting seminar series guidelines will be shared with the presenter afterwards, even if they are not read a lot. Your comments are very much appreciated. The presentations are being video recorded and will be made available on the TOPS website, tobaccopolicy.org. I will turn the presentation over to today's moderator, Mike Pasco from Georgia State University to introduce our speakers. Thank you, C. Our first presenter is Arjun Teotia. He will be leading a single paper presentation entitled Effective Cigar and Cigarette Taxes in Reducing Youth Smoking. Arjun is a PhD candidate in economics at Georgia State University. He is a health economist who studies risky behaviors, tobacco control policy. He is on the job market this year and will be presenting his job market paper today. Our discussion for this paper is Kevin Sprath, an associate professor of public health at Rutgers University. Arjun, thank you for presenting for us today. Thanks, Mike, for the introduction and thanks for the opportunity. Thanks, everyone, for being here for my talk. Uh, today, I will be talking about my job market paper, the effect of cigar and cigarette taxes in reducing youth smoking. As most of us are tobacco policy researchers, we already know that tobacco use is the leading cause of preventable death. It is not only associated with health concerns, but other significant health and economic costs as well. Thus, reducing smoking is an important policy goal, and it has been at the forefront of health policy goals for the last three decades. An effective strategy in that, to that end, an effective strategy in reducing overall smoking is to focus on youth smoking as most adults report smoking their first cigarette when they're teenagers. Thus, if, as policymakers, if we can prevent people from initiating smoking at young age, it is less likely that they will become smokers when they get become adults. Among different types of products, tobacco products that are there on the market, Cigarettes and cigars are two of the products that I'm going to focus on for this talk. And in order to decrease cigarette and cigar use among youth, tobacco taxes have been used as one of the main, important, main policy levers. Among taxes on different tobacco products, that is cigarettes and cigars, policymakers have primarily focused on cigarettes and cigarettes and cigars are taxed much differently. Thus, in this paper, I study whether cigar and cigarette taxes reduce cigar and cigarette use among youth. When I talk about cigars, the first thought that usually comes to our mind is that of Winston Churchill smoking a large cigars. And at this point, I want to differentiate between different types of cigars that exist in the market. We have three different types of cigars. First, it's a little cigar. A little cigar is very close to a cigarette and the only difference between the two is in the weight of the two products. And little cigar is rolled in tobacco paper, whereas cigarette is rolled in uh, regular thin paper. The other type of cigar is a cigarillo, which can come in either a tipped form or a non-tipped form, and it contains about one and a half times tobacco as a little cigar or a cigarette does. And the third type of cigar is the traditional large cigars that we generally think about when we talk about cigars. But the most prevalent form of cigars these days is the cigarillo, and cigarillos and cigars form about 95% of the cigar market. In addition to the above, cigars are available in flavors. And they have seen a slow and steady rise in sales over the, over the decade and many health policy 
papers have actually discussed this that discussed this slow increase in prevalence of cigars in addition to being a product that is available in flavor cigars is also more cigar use is also more common among low income population male populations african american and lgbtq lgbtq populations in addition to that currently cigar is more commonly smoked among high school boys as compared to cigarettes that is cigarettes cigars have now become more common than cigarettes among at least among high school boys which begs the question and leads me to explaining comparing these two products that is what are the differences between these two products firstly in the context of the health risks posed by these products most studies show that cigarettes and cigars pose similar health risks and neither product is healthier than the other despite having uh, similar health differences similar despite posing similar health risk there are some differences in regulation that exist in these products as we can see from this picture that cigars are available in packs of 2 3 and 4 commonly termed among students as loosies which are avail meaning that they are available in smaller quantities of 2 3 and 4 and ranging from price of 25 cent per cigarillo to about 75 cents for an expensive one as opposed to cigarettes which are only available in packs of 20 making them a more expensive per unit investment for a young high school students in addition to the difference in the number they can the students can purchase cigar cigars are also available in a wide variety of sweet flavors such as strawberry banana chocolate which might be more attractive to students apart from being available in smaller packages flavors taxes on cigarettes are much higher than taxes on cigars thereby making cigarettes much more expensive as compared to cigars apart from the above attractive features that might be to students cigars are also rolled in tobacco leaf which makes them more likely to be hollowed out and re-rolled with either a mix of tobacco and marijuana or just marijuana products which is also quite common among high school students which and this leads me to uh, uh, try and understand the question that are cigarette taxes driving youth into the use of other products such as cigars why is it important why do we want to know about these cross tax effect why do we want to know what's happening to cigar use why is that even important it is important as we want to understand it from a wholesome perspective that is if people if people switch across product or start using multiple products due to a higher tax on one of the tobacco products analyzing only cigarettes would overestimate the effectiveness of cigarette taxes that is if the cross tax effects are positive and sufficiently large it would mean that we could end up with a group of smokers which is not necessarily cigarette smokers but a group of smokers that is smoking cigars which is detrimental to the final goal of the health policy which is to reduce the overall smoking rates and not just a reduce in uh, cigarette use thus which leads me to say that what we know about tobacco tax in smoking is the upper bound of the effective range of cigarette taxes if we are not paying attention to the possible cross tax effects on cigars and marijuana when we think about smoking so what do we know about these cross tax effects from literature on the effect of cigar tax on cigarette use we do not have any reliable evidence currently that how cigar taxes affect cigarette use and we do have some recent evidence which has consisted that cigar cigarette taxes do not have have a very small own tax effect that is cigarette taxes have small effect on cigarette use the evidence of on the effect of tobacco taxes on cigar use is mixed while some studies suggest that increase in cigarette tax increases cigar use another study suggests that an increase in cigarette tax decreases cigar use 
the results the estimates from literature on marijuana use are also quite similar to cigarette use and show that cigarette taxes are, have no uh, really don't have any effect on marijuana consumption and we don't have any reliable estimates on the effect of cigar taxes on marijuana use thus what are my research questions what are the research questions that i am trying to answer and what are my contributions through this paper the first question that i try and answer is that what are the effects of cigarette and cigar tax on youth cigarette and cigar use that is is there substitution from cigarette to cigars are are higher cigarette taxes leading people to switch across different tobacco products by studying this i find an asymmetry in the cross tax elasticities that is when i study cigarette use cigarettes and cigars appear to be complements that is cross tax elasticity is negative which means that an increase in cigar tax leads to a decrease in cigarette use while when i study cigar use i find that cigarettes and cigars appear to be substitutes which means that the cross tax elasticity is positive a positive cross tax elasticity implies that an increase in cigarette tax leads to an increase in cigar use which is something that we are concerned about this asymmetry in cross tax elasticity has not yet been discussed in literature and while trying to find a possible explanation for this elasticity i find that marijuana use might be a reason for this asymmetry marijuana is the most smoked product among youth and most active marijuana smokers are engaged in smoking a uh, another tobacco alternative post the main analysis i account for potential misreporting in my estimates and i report estimates that are that control for potential misreporting in self reported smoking as some studies suggest that when in self reported surveys on risky behaviors there is a potential for certain under reporting of risky behaviors by high school students at uh, at this point i would like to take a pause for questions great um uh, our discussant is um kevin asgrop and uh, would you like to provide any comments here uh sure uh it's it's pronounced shroth but uh, no worries i've been uh dealing with that for many years. Um, uh, so yeah, I, I think this is really interesting stuff and, and I appreciate it. And one of the interesting things about this is that um, Arjun is dealing with a topic that uh, where, where the literature hasn't really evolved or been challenged much in a number of years. And there's this conventional, uh, thinking out there that if you increase the price of cigarettes by about 10%, you get very predictable decreases in consumption uh, for adults. The, the conventional analysis is that adults uh, decrease their consumption of cigarettes by about 4% and youth are more uh, price sensitive than, than adults and decrease their consumption by about six or 7% percent and uh, on top of that there's this uh, additional layer of the uh, analysis that says that half of that decrease is based on people quitting and the other half is on people uh, smoking less or consuming less and that's that's it that's that's a very conventional body of research that's uh, been out there and has been established uh, in places, not just in the US, but in places around the world. But it doesn't deal with the idea of how other tobacco products fit into the equation. And nor does it deal with the question of what, you know, what's happening with marijuana. And, and that's why this study is interesting. It's dealing, it's, it's kind of opening uh, the analysis into a broader level. And on top of that, okay, so maybe there is some truth to some of those old studies, or at least there, perhaps there was at a period of time. But when you look forward and you have adult cigarette use declining from somewhere in the 20s, uh, 10 to 15 years ago, 
down to 13 to 15% now, depending on the jurisdiction, and youth smoking going from somewhere around 17 to 20%, depending on the jurisdiction 10 to 20 years ago, down to about 5%. So when, when youth use gets down to a level that's that low, 5%, it makes sense that there might be different responses to changes in price. Uh, so, so I'm going to uh, stop at this point. I, I, I'm sure I'll have some more comments as we get uh, into uh, a little further into the uh, analysis. And if you have any comments in response to some of my initial observations, I'd be interested in hearing them now. Thank you. Those were some great insightful observations. And, uh, and I agree with you on having a very, most of us having a very conventional view of the market. And one thing, one point that I think we usually miss is that the industry has evolved much. 20 years back, cigarettes were the only most important product that was smoked. So much so that 1994 Surgeon General Report did not mention that there were the alternative tobacco products exist. So, I think that in that context, the market has evolved that much that since when government bans products, flavored products or uh, flavored cigarettes, market comes up, the industry comes up with some other alternative that they might, because they don't want to lose that market share. So as policymakers and researchers, we need to think a little differently because we, the market to, today is not uh, the same as it was 20 years back. And, the products have evolved. So just focusing on one side of the picture gives us probably not the right approach to go ahead. Thanks, Arjun. Uh, in in um, uh, respecting the time here that we have left, I think we will hold the, the Q&A questions for, um, for after your presentation to allow you to finish that. And then hopefully we have time to um, circle back to these Q&A questions. Thank you. I will carry on with my data section. To answer my question, I use national uh, individual level data from the national and state YRBS, Youth Risk Behavioral Surveillance System. The YRBS is a set of repeated cross-sectional surveys carried out every other year since 1991. I use data since from 1999 to 2017, as the YRBS started asking questions on the use of alternative tobacco products only since 1999. Among my dependent variables from the YRBS, I use current cigarette use, cigar use, and marijuana use. Current use of a product is defined as having used that product on at least one day in the last 30 days. Among the individual level covariates I use from the YRBS are age, sex, and race. I have approximately 875,000 observations from the YRBS. I match those observations with data on state cigarette and cigar taxes from the CDC state system. In addition to matching that data with tobacco taxes, I control for factors that might affect smoking or any policies related to smoking by uh, controlling for factors such as comprehensive smoke-free air laws, marijuana decriminalization laws, marijuana legalization laws, state per capita personal incomes, and state unemployment rates. In addition to these policies, I also control for various policies on e-cigarettes, such as e-cigarette minimum purchase, uh, minimum age purchase laws, as well as the presence of e-cigarette taxes in any of the states. Table one presents summary statistics from my data set, and as we see that since 1999, cigarette smoking has fallen from about 32% to 8%. During the same period, cigar use has seen a more modest decline from 17% to 8%. In the current wave of data in 2019, cigar use is actually higher than cigarette use among high school students. Interestingly, marijuana is the most popular product that is smoked among youth. Most active smokers in the, as most active young smokers smoke marijuana, and most marijuana smokers also smoke multiple tobacco products. About 70% of cigar users smoke marijuana. 
During 1999 to 2017, cigarette taxes have also seen a very drastic increase and have increased by about 300% from 50 cents per pack in 1999 to about $1.94 uh, per pack in 2017. During the same period, the increase in cigar tax has again been very modest and which, uh, which it has only increased by about 60% during my sample period. To estimate the effect of cigarette and cigar tax on cigarette and cigar use, I use a difference in differences approach and my outcome variable, cigarette, cigar or marijuana use is a function of cigarette tax, cigar tax, a bunch of state and individual level covariates that I mentioned in the previous slide, as well as state and year fixed effects. I estimate this equation using a logic model and estimate and report marginal effects as well as elasticities. Identification of the causal effect comes from uh, within state variation. As I use state and year fixed effects in my model, it accounts for factors that change over time, but are constant across states and factors that are constant over time, but have, are different across state, which leaves the variation, the identifying variation as the within variation that exists. Among the number of changes or variations that are that exist in cigarette and cigar tax during my sample period 47 states changed their cigarette tax between one uh, between uh, 47 states changed their cigarette tax between 1999 to 2017 the maximum number of changes were about 13 tax changes per state and the minimum number was uh, zero few states uh, did not change their cigarette tax during the entire sample period during the same period, 36 states changed their cigarette cigar tax at least once. In total, there were approximately 350 tax changes in my sample period. Table two shows my main results from the analysis. Column one shows cigarette use as the dependent variable. Column two shows cigar use as the dependent variable. And column three shows marijuana use as the dependent variable. I will... Uh, uh, interpret the coefficient that is in block uh, that is in bold that is the elasticity estimate which is the percentage change in participation over the percentage change in the tax of the product from row one row one shows the coefficient of cigarette taxes and i find that a hundred percent increase in cigarette taxes leads to a 2.11 percent and insignificant decrease in cigarette use Whereas a 100% increase in cigarette tax leads to a 12.64% increase in cigar use and a 7.48% and statistically significant increase in marijuana use. Results from row two, which show the coefficient of cigar tax, shows that a 100% increase in cigar tax lead to a 5.03% decrease in cigarette use, a 0.58% decrease in cigar use, and a 4.73% decrease in marijuana use. Thus, what do these results mean? Firstly, as we see that there's an asymmetry in the cross-tax elasticity. Row one, column two shows that increase in cigarette tax increases cigar use. And row two, column one shows that an increase in cigar tax decreases cigar use. And that's a conundrum that I have, have been trying to understand that why would we see different cross tax elasticities for products that are so similar. And the explanation possibly lies in analyzing a third product, which is the most active product and which leads to the possibility of thinking about it in a different way. That is, we are facing the possibility of different groups of smokers, that is, we have cigarette smokers and there's a group of smokers that are primarily marijuana smokers, but they usually use cigars, not to smoke cigars, but to use cigars along with marijuana, as can be seen with the different, with the cross tax elasticities. What I mean to say is that looking at tobacco use from the lens of only cigarettes presents a an incomplete picture and we need to pay more attention to what's happening with tobacco use along with 
marijuana use as youth are increasingly using marijuana along with cigars and 70%, more than 70% of cigar smokers smoke marijuana. So at this stage, when we are a lower proportion of youth are actually smoking tobacco, we want to think at it, we want to go at this problem probably from a different perspective. That is, these are, this might not be the group that would be discouraged from smoking by just increasing cigarette taxes. We need to look at it from a more wholesome perspective of policies on cigar tax as well as policies on marijuana use. Thus, what are my main conclusions? Reducing, firstly, reducing the difference between cigar and cigarette tax can help reduce smoking. Increasing cigar tax can be an effective tool to reduce smoking and we need to pay a little more attention to it. In addition, if increasing only cigarette tax leads to an increase in cigar and marijuana use, when I account for misreporting, I find that misreporting increases the magnitude of the elasticity estimates. That is, the positive effects might actually be higher than what I find in my current results. Thus, I say that there's a need to understand marijuana use and its interaction with tobacco products among youth, especially with cigars, if we actually want to achieve an overall reduction in smoking. In my future work, I plan to address the heterogeneity in the type of smokers, that is, trying to find what type of smokers are we dealing with, C cigarette smokers as a group and marijuana smokers as a separate group, because marijuana smokers are more involved in cigar use as compared to cigarette smokers. And additionally, an interesting feature would be to analyze tobacco use modeling for marijuana taxes and marijuana prices. Currently, nine states have a tax on marijuana, which is based on different metrics, that is on wholesale price, weight, or THC level. And two states are still thinking about what kind of tax they want to impose. They're still making some policy decisions there. So with increasing legalization, it is all the more important to see how that is going to affect tobacco products in the future, especially cigar use, when we are already seeing an increasing trend in cigar use. Uh, that's it from my side for this talk. And if I would welcome any feedback and suggestions or discussions uh, or via email if we are not able to discuss here today. And thank you so much. Thanks, Arjun. Um, so we only have uh, two minutes. Uh, so I'll give Kevin a chance to make some comments. And then um, likely we won't have a chance to uh, discuss the Q&A. However, Arjun, you can uh, answer the questions in the Q&A then during Daphne's talk. And if anybody else wants to um, ask Arjun questions, Go ahead and do that. Just put Arjun's name at the top of the um, of the the question, so that Arjun knows that that one is directed to him. Um, go ahead, Kevin. Sure. Thanks. Um, so first, I'd just like to congratulate Arjun on doing some really interesting work and uh, kind of opening the the lid of the box onto a whole uh, a very promising and interesting vein of uh, analysis that can be done now and in the future. I understand that the the data that you were looking back go, looks back a little bit and uh, aside from marijuana, an incredibly popular product out there, uh, especially over the last three to five years is electronic cigarettes among youth and trying to get, uh, try, I, I think it would be really useful and helpful to also analyze the extent to which uh, cigarette prices can influence e-cigarette use among youth and how that factors in, and, and, and even also looking at e-cigarette use within the con, along with cigars and marijuana use, and, and a lot of the, a lot of e-cigarette users um, are using e-cigarettes not just to get their nicotine, but also to vape uh, THC oils. So, so the so the market is continuing to get more complex. And the data always lags behind that. I understand that. So sometimes we can't get, a, you know, we, we don't have our hands on the data yet that's going to uh, influence the next uh, research studies that are coming down the pike. So I, I know that's uh, coming out there. Um, one other just quick observation. <clears throat> I was a little bit surprised that the increases in cigar taxes didn't really have a, a significant impact on cigar use. Uh, at the same time, 
uh, increases in cigar, cigar tax led to a decrease in marijuana use. And I thought that I would see a decrease in cigar use, which might uh, parallel or be similar to the decrease in marijuana use, especially considering that some of those marijuana users are going to use cigars for their blunts. So I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on that, if there's time. Um, Arjun, one minute maybe, and then we should uh, yes. move to the next presenter. Thank you. Thanks for the points. And again, really insightful and great points. And I myself have been thinking about that quite a lot. Um, and I will actually move back to that slide. Uh, and we are discussing uh, row two, column two, that is a very small and insignificant effect of cigar tax on cigar use and a very and a larger effect of cigar tax on marijuana use. One possible uh, reason that I, I think of it is as that when I look at it in terms of averages, the smallest group of smokers that I have is cigar smokers, whereas both cigarettes and marijuana smokers are the larger groups of people that I, I a larger, uh, the largest smoked products that I see are cigarettes and marijuana as compared to cigars. So I think it might have to do with the smaller market size of cigars as compared to marijuana and cigarettes. But it is something that I'm quite interested in finding out and I'm trying to myself think about it. Thank you. Okay, thank, thank you, Arjun. Uh, next, Daphne Wu will lead a single paper presentation entitled Impact of Vaping Introduction on Cigarette Smoking Among Young Adults in Four High-Income Countries, an Interrupted Time Series Analysis. Daphne Wu is a research analyst at the Center for Global Health Research at the University of Toronto. She has a Master of Sciences degree in Public Health and Health Systems from the University of Waterloo and is currently working on global tobacco control. Dr. Prabhat Jha, who is also an author of this paper, paper will respond to select Q&As. Our discussant for this paper is Dr. Justin White. Daphne, thank you for presenting for us today. Can I share screen? I see you, but I don't see your slides. Uh, I'm trying to share screen. It says host disabled participants. Oh. Arjun, could you make Daphne the host, please? Yes, just a moment. Uh, where do I make host from? Where do, uh... You just click on Daphne's name and it'll give you the option of uh, uh, making host if you right click. Make host. Great, thank you. everybody uh, today uh, I'm Daphne my uh, today my presentation is entitled impact of vaping introduction on cigarette smoking among young adults in four high-income countries and interrupted time series analysis uh, here is the agenda for today we'll start with a bit of background on e-cigarettes so uh, use of electronic nicotine delivery systems particularly e-cigarettes, also known as vaping, has become popular in many high-income countries in recent years, especially among youth and young adults. Electronic cigarettes or e-cigarettes are handheld and generate an aerosol-containing flavorings with or without nicotine, thereby mimicking the look and feel of conventional cigarettes. There's been a long-standing debate on whether e-cigarettes act as a gateway to cigarette smoking among youth and young adults. That is whether it would lead to smoking among those who would otherwise not smoke in the future. So based on that, our research question for today is, does vaping introduction reduce or increase the sex specific prevalence of smoking among, youth, among young adults in Canada, subnationally and nationally in the UK, Japan and Australia? And we did uh, the analysis uh, subnationally by province in Canada because unlike the UK, Japan, and Australia, vaping regulations by provinces in Canada do vary quite a bit. And our hypothesis is introduction of vaping reduced that sex-specific prevalence of smoking among young adults in the four countries. Uh, here is the methodology. We chose the four countries of UK, 
Canada, Japan, and Australia based on availability of data on smoking prevalence by age and sex, and then availability on cigarette on data on cigarette sales, which we use as an indicator of cigarette consumption. And in all these countries, they have different uh, approaches to vaping regulations. For, for example, in terms of max, maximum perm, permissible nicotine level allowed in these countries is the highest in Canada for, of 66 mg per mole, one third of that at 20 mg per mole in the UK, whereas nicotine is not, permittable, is not permitted in e-cigarettes in Australia. And in Japan, the very popular heat not burn products similar to e-cigarettes has nicotine levels comparable to cigarettes. And for our study, the measures of smoking that we used is the first is the prevalence of smoking among young adults, which we defined as individuals aged 18 to about 30 stratified by sex. And second is the annual cigarette sales, which we use as an indicator for consumption per adult aged 18 years and over. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll take a break at that for about five, five minutes of questions. Okay, thank you. Um, Justin, do you have any discussion comments at this point? Uh, just uh, a couple quick things. So the first would be uh, more common, I guess, uh, is that during our first top seminar back in September, we had Jean-Francois Atter um, talking about the gateway effects. And he was arguing in particular that uh, there's a common cause of cigarette use and vaping in adolescence that makes it a little bit hard to tease out um, what's causing what. And in particular, he hypothesized that there was a propensity to use drugs underlying them both. And I think the, the key point here was that there could be a lot of unmeasured confounding. That's a big challenge in this literature. And I think um, is something that needs to be um, dealt with in, uh, in a study to be really credible. And I, I wonder when you were designing the study, if that's something that you thought about or um, if that sort of informed your thinking about um, gateway effects more generally. Uh, some, so one of the things that we did over here uh, that we'll uh, mention later in the uh, when we discuss more on the analysis is we took into account uh, cigarette price and tax uh, for our analysis. So our analysis is accounted for cigarette price. And then uh, other than that, for example, uh, in terms of uh, social confounders, uh, we did not account for that. Okay. Just to jump in there, uh, Jonathan, I think you're right. I mean, there these behaviors are uh, trying to measure them on kids uh, who aren't human is very difficult to do because there's so many peer effects. There's, uh, there's uh, fashion effects, uh, fade effects. So trying to unpack all of these. And I think people who've been following the literature even know careful studies that try to follow up individual adolescents uh, over time and try to ascertain their behavior. They have all sorts of issues, including the reporting. You know, I think some of the kids just basically lie and there's a lot of social desirability bias, even in the surveys. But our objective here was not to look at that micro level, but just look more at the macro level as Daphne will go into to see whether aggregate sales or aggregate consumption stratified by sex and age was affected and as you'll see, the, the benefit here is the interrupted time series should be reasonably unbiased. I mean, there's some uh, things that we'll get into. And the main, main determinant, uh, of course, is uh, uh, tax and price levels for which we've adjusted. And then I think we're looking forward to some feedback from the, uh, the audience about how to consider the context. And Daphne, as she'll describe, tried to measure the variation in basically regulatory approaches for uh, both uh, vaping products and cigarettes across jurisdictions. And you know, that's not so straightforward. And one of the reasons you don't see the United States included is it was a real mess to try to sort out the US state level data. So that's why we're not presenting it. Thanks, and then, and then just one other question around, you, you mentioned uh, the focus is specifically around gender specific effects on smoking. And I'm curious about, um, maybe why you expected that association with vaping introduction to vary, 
um, by gender and sort of what, what um, aside from the fact that clearly there are differences in smoking prevalence by gender across these countries, but it, if there was something more specific around the mechanisms here, why it might be gender specific? No, I think it is you don't know until you look. So we wanted to see if it were different, it was different by uh, sex. So it, no particular hypothesis, just it might be different uh, by uh, girls and boys. Great, I'll hold other questions at this point. Thanks. Okay, um, I'll, I'll let you continue, uh, Daphne. I think that there's one Q&A for you, but I think you addressed it coming up in your talk. So I'll hold off okay. on that for now. Yeah. Uh, so here is the data source for our study for uh, the prevalence data. They are mostly nationally representative surveys for the countries. And each group, uh, group analyzed, there are 18 plus minus about 34 at the, high, at the upper end. Uh, that's just because based on uh, what is available for the countries and the consumption data some for, for, uh, for Canada and Japan, the consumption is measured in terms of number of cigarettes uh, sticks sold and for the UK and Australia that uh, the sales number was in terms of uh, local currency units. And uh, for our analysis, we use interrupted time series analysis or ITS. In an ITS analysis, a series of observations over time is used to create a trend using a regression. So we can, we can uh, use the figure on the right as reference. The green line at the bottom that's starting at about 22, that is the, let's say that is the first set of lines that we call the underlying trend before the intervention. For example, in this case, the intervention comes into effect in 2004. So how we do it is, uh, we look at the difference in the slope before and after the intervention and using that we quantify the effect of the intervention. And in our study, the intervention here is the uptake of e-cigarettes for which there is no uh, fixed intervention point because e-cigarettes is not like a policy where it comes into effect at a specific time point. And then for, uh, therefore, because there is no uh, fixed intervention time point, we use the first year when national surveys included questions on the use of e-cigarettes. Whereas for Japan, uh, instead of using e-cigarettes, we use uh, heat not burn products, which are popular there. And then we use 2016 as the intervention year in Japan because uh, the first survey that asked questions on use of HNB products, which must, much, was much later in 2018. And the unit of analysis is province for Canada and country for UK, Japan, and Australia. And the model was adjusted for cigarette tax or price as a potential confounder. So our, uh, here is our results. We, I'll first present the results by province in Canada. So in Alberta, we used 2013 as the intervention year. We found that using 2013 as the intervention, the e-cigarette e uptake did not have a significant impact on cigarette smoking among males aged 18 to 34. So uh, the y-axis is smoking prevalence and you're on the x-axis. Whereas in females, we see that after each e-cigarette introduction in 2013 as assumed, cigarette smoking prevalence declined significantly slower after 2013. So we see uh, the slope change, a positive slope change indicates that a slower decline, a slower decline in cigarette smoking prevalence was observed uh, after than before. So and the, and the red numbers indicate significance. Whereas uh, cigarette consumption in terms of uh, sales per adult, it increased significantly in 2013, but declined significantly faster after 2013 compared to before. Uh, in British Columbia, we found no significant effect of e-cigarette introduction on either the level change or slope change for, for either males or females or in cigarette consumption per adult of no significance. Uh, in Ontario, we see that for males aged 18 to 34, e-cigarette introduction, after e-cigarette introduction, uh, smoking declines smoking declined significantly faster after compared to before. Whereas for females in 2013, smoking uh, prevalence declined uh, significantly in that year. Uh, this falls in line with what, uh, what our sales data tells us. Our sales data tell us that after e-cigarette introduction, smoking declined much faster than before. 
And in Quebec, we found no significance in slope, in slope change or level change for males and females 80 to 34 years. But in terms of cigarette consumption per adult, uh, it declined significantly faster after the in, after e-cigarette introduction compared to before. Uh, for the UK, we analyzed the data by two age groups, 16 to 24 and 25 to 34, using 2012 as the intervention year. So in the younger 16 to 24 years age group, we find that smoking prevalence among males declined significantly slower from 2012 compared to before 2012, but no significant impact was observed for females. In the older 25 to 34 age group, however, smoking prevalence increased significantly in 2012 for both sexes. And for females only, the decline was significantly faster from 2012 compared to before. In, and in terms of cigarette consumption per adult measured as retail sales value, we found no significant change on either level or slope from 2012. And in Japan, using 2016 as the intervention year, we find that smoking prevalence among males and females in the younger 20 to 29 year age group declined faster from 2016 onwards compared to before, but the difference was not significant. But smoking prevalence in the female age at 30 to 39 years age group increased significantly in 2016. In terms of cigarette consumption per adult, measured as number of sticks sold, it declined significantly faster from 2016 compared to before. In Australia, we used two national surveys, the Australian National Health Survey, AHS, and the National Drug Strategy Household Survey, or the NDSHS. Both surveys are conducted every two to three years. So for the purpose of a study, we interpolated the data between two survey years to obtain annual estimates. So for males aged 18 to 24 years, using 2016 as the intervention year, we found that smoking prevalence increased significantly from 2016 according to both the surveys AHS and NDSHS. But for females, smoking declined significantly faster from 2016 according to AHS. It also declined according to the NDSHS, but the decline was not significant. Among those aged 25 to 34 years, we found no significant change in either level or slope change from 2016. In terms of cigarette consumption per adult measured as average spending on tobacco, not including e-cigarettes, cigarette consumption increased significantly in 2016 and the trend in decline slowed down significantly from 2016. So here is the summary of our findings in more detailed numbers. So we find that uh, generally in Alberta, we see that uh, cigarette consumption, it declined faster after the intervention. And similarly, this was also found in Ontario and Quebec, not in BC. Whereas uh, in, the, in, the UK and also in the UK and Australia, we see that e-cigarette introduction actually slowed down the decline in smoking. Whereas uh, in Japan, Japan was uh, what we observed in the, Japan was similar to what was found in Ontario, uh, that after e-cigarette introduction, uh, cigarette smoking increased, cigarette smoking slowed down significantly faster. So based on what we observed here, uh, we can we can probably uh, interpret it based on the context because all these contexts have different vaping regulations and uh, different. Uh, maximum permit, permissible nicotine level for vaping products. So um, that's why we are observing the difference in the results. And then this slide basically just shows the difference, uh, the difference in vaping policy. For example, in Canada, the maximum nicotine level permittable in vaping products is 66 mg per mils. In the UK is 20, whereas in Japan is much higher, like in cigarettes, whereas uh, in Australia, uh, Nicotine is just not allowed in e-cigarettes, even in terms of vaping policy, for example, in terms of smoking around public places, it varies significantly in Canada. For instance, in Alberta, we see that there's no provincial legislation, whereas in BC, uh, the, re the, uh, the regulations are much more strict.
limitations of a study. A study has a number of limitations and these include uh, there is no fixed intervention point for e-cigarettes since e-cigarettes is not introduced as a specific, at a specific time point. We also did not account for smoking in intensity and frequency and for smoking laws within in the setting. However, based on this study, we may be able to infer that vaping, whether vaping acts as, as a gateway to smoking among young adults may depend maybe context specific depending on the vaping policies in the country, depending on whether nicotine, what is the nicotine level allowed in the country. For example, in Australia, we see that when nicotine is level, when nicotine is not allowed in e-cigarettes, the e-cigarette introduction actually uh, increased smoking prevalence, like uh, it slow, it uh, made slow the decline in smoking. Thank you. Thank you, Daphne. Um, okay. Justin, do you have any further discussion comments? Yeah, really interesting. Thanks so much, Daphne. Um, I, I think I had a similar reaction to some of the other questions about the trying to determine when the intervention point um, should be defined. And so uh, you, you chose the date when ends were first asked about in surveys and there could be a lag there. And so I wonder if you could perhaps test the sensitivity to, to different dates of introduction um, or thinking about other objective measures of, of um, the introduction date. Um, so for example, 2016, I think was used in Australia and that seems probably late to me in terms of when it might've been available and similarly in, in some of the other um, countries. So um, it, it might be worth thinking uh, about that introduction date and, and how your results change based on um, that assumption. Um, yeah, we did our sensitivity analysis using one and two years before the, before uh, what, we showed in our current, uh, in my current presentation, and there was not really any difference. Okay, interesting. Mm -hmm. um, I, I would also be curious to hear more about the regression model that you were using to measure the level changes and slope changes. And in particular, looking at the visual evidence in those graphs, there it does seem like functional form matters. And, um, you know, I, it, there, I, I have a little bit of concern that there might be overfitting, but I, I'm not clear whether you're using sort of a segmented linear regression on e either side of the threshold as is common in ITS or not. Um, and especially given that there's only five data points on either side of the threshold in some cases, um, it does seem like I, I would probably default to that linear uh, specification. Okay. Are you able to say anything more about the regression model that you were using and whether it was? Uh, no, we just used a linear regression based on the based on the observations, and then it was adjusted for cigarette price and tax or tax. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think Jonathan, that's in part guided by how the interrupted time series analysis works. So it's, it, I mean, it's very simple. You basically are fitting um, a, a set of observations which you've noted are reasonably limited. The number of time points is reasonably limited. And the more time points you have before and after the period change, the more robust it will be. So that is also a limitation of the data. So it's, you fit a linear trend uh, to the trends uh, that were observed before. And uh, then, uh, then we apply this interruption and really quantify the effects of the intervention. Um, and then what Daphne did was adjust for prices in uh, defining the trend lines, uh, prices or taxes. So it's, it's a pretty simple, and you know, that's kind of the nice beauty of ITS is that it's a reasonably simple analysis. Um, some of the comments on the, the chat, I think, have been helpful because you see that, yes, the, the, the tricky part is when did you actually get a reasonable introduction of the product, meaning not just that it became legal, but it had significant enough market share that uh, you could affect, you would expect it to have uh, impact on cigarette consumption in either way. So uh, you know, I think that's one of the challenges of trying to sort this out. So hopefully with uh, another year of data, this will become more robust. And I will add one uh, more point, which I think was interesting. The Australia results to me were quite surprising, suggesting at least, you know, it increased uh, the cigarette uh, use, at least in males. And that's not inconsistent with some of the literature 
that suggests that uh, as the point that you were making that kids are just experimenting and if uh, cigarettes and vaping products are uh, substitutes, uh, which uh, I certainly believe, then it, uh, it, you know, it might have been that they were uh, kids who weren't into experimenting suddenly had something new to experiment and that might have moved them to cigarettes. So the Australia results are interesting. And very crudely, you do see a, um, a gradient, in, at least in terms of the nicotine levels. Uh, there has been, of course, suggestions, and some of our colleagues have mentioned that, well, if you're looking at a real switch, if you've got a nicotine market and kids really wanting to get a buzz, then certainly the high nicotine products will be more, uh, more attractive to them. So, I mean, these are tricky things to sort out, but there's, you know, there's some interesting suggestions here that the, the policy context uh, and the speed of the uptake of vaping products also matters. And that's something I think Daphne plans to try to get more detailed data, uh, including more uh, disaggregated sales data to see how much of, you know, what was the slope of increase in, uh, in vaping products. And that establishes the effective time period for your ITS, not just the year of introduction. Daphne, do you want to add anything to those comments? Uh, no. Uh, so I, I could keep asking, but I, I think in the interest of time, I'll, I'll pass it over to back to you. Yeah. Um, I think we are out of time. Um, thank you, Arjun and Daphne, for the presentations and to the moderator and discussions. Our next seminar speaker is Han Alcott of Microsoft Research and Harvard University. On Thursday, January 7th, 2021, his presentation title is Optimal Regulation of E-Cigarettes, Theory and Evidence. If you would like to present for tops, please submit your proposals through our online portal by January 5th, 2021 to be considered for the spring season. We average over 100 attendees per top seminar and it's a great place to get feedback on research and exposure within the tobacco policy community. After leaving this seminar, you will have an opportunity to complete a survey on your satisfaction with the seminar today. We appreciate the feedback you will also receive an email with uh, instructions for how you can receive a certificate for your attend attendance today. Thanks again for participating and we will see you next year. Happy holidays. Bye everyone. Thank you, Say. Thanks everyone. Thanks Justin. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.